you're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here discussing, at long last, after years of requests and requests and requests, the innocence of Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton. It has been a long time coming. It has been such a long time coming that S.S. Van Dyne has already spoiled one story in this collection for us. Mm-hmm. Thankfully not the one we're looking to solve today, but, indeed, you know, <laughs> we appreciate it. We are talking The Blue Cross, The Secret Garden, The Queer Feet, The Flying Stars, and The Invisible Man, the last of which Herds has challenged me to solve. Herds, what do we need to know about Father Brown? He's a clergyman. He's very unassuming, so much so that you might be a detective on a case and literally walk past him on a train and think nothing of him. And his umbrella, his little strange habits of speech of saying very little, but meaning very much. And he has, I think, a big black hat. Like, look, the man is an enigma in that he leaves very little of an impression. He is a simple man of the cloth, man of God. And he is more interested in debating philosophy with his targets with the people that he figures out, you know, the criminals that he quote unquote catches than he is in, I don't know, tripping people up and throwing them over tables and, and being all very impressive, which is kind of ironic that we're, we're considering Van Dyne in the same phrase <laughs> as, as Father Brown at all. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, Chesterton is immensely influential in sort of three main strands is the way that it's been explained to me. The main ones is that he's had a huge influence on impossible crimes, stuff like The Invisible Man and The Wrong Shape in this collection. Yep. Uh, Very notorious for having some very silly impossible crime shenanigans. Then there's what we were talking about with Alex Pavesi with this very like philosophical, metaphysical nonsense that's going on. And then there's, like, the characters. The characters in these stories are, they're just absurd. <laughs> well, what, what I was kind of surprised about, because this is my first time reading Chesterton at all, you know, preparing for this, this little stint, this little series here, was the continuity. Because there are some characters who continue from one story to the next, most notably Flambeau the world famous thief who is the the star of the first story and is still kicking around. He has like a full on spiritual conversion of he's upstaged by father Brown mm-hmm. in the, the flying stars. And the other characters, of course, detective Valentin, who were introduced to as a kind of like, he's the police detective, you know, he's, yes. he's bumbling. He's still reasonably well respected by the police community and, by golly gee, Father Brown's going to help him catch the killer so he can take all the credit and Father Brown doesn't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. But plot twist, Valentin is scum. Yeah, I, I thought <laughs> like, what was going to happen when I was reading this wild. first story was going to be that it was like, oh, cool, I understand. Valentin mm. is going to be the Watson in this relationship exactly. with Father Brown, even though not. he's the detective. No. But then in the second story, he's the murderer. He's the murderer and Flambeau is the Watson, or at least the closest thing that we get to a, a Watsonian character with this being written before the archetype. By the way, I love the foreshadowing for this happening. Mm-hmm. In the first story, there's this line that says that Valentine was unfathomably French and that the French intelligence <laughs> is just intelligence. Like, yep. he was a thinking man. And basically, Chesterton here is saying that the French have no taste for art, which is <laughs> such a wonderfully British sentiment. <laughs> yeah. It was Flambeau. I, I'm not actually 100% certain. What nationality is he? Do we know? I'm pretty sure Flambeau is also fr- His name's Flambeau. How can he not I, be well, French? That's what well, that's what I'm saying, because he he does appreciate art, is the yes. thing. So, and that's that's what makes him a candidate for working with Father Brown, because the, the Flying Star story is him talking to his children, saying, hey, I, I did this beautiful crime this one time. And it was the most... most amazing thing I ever did. 
and it's why I'm a Christian now. And it's like, uh-huh. it's wild. It's, it's a wild idea, but because he cares about like the art of the steel yes. that allows him to engage on the same philosophical level with Father Brown during the first story, which is obviously where we, we meet the two. They're like sitting on a bench discussing crime and, and God and, and where reason enters into society. They're both very experienced in the criminal world from other sides, which yes, is great fun yes, yeah. in that Father Brown has heard everyone's confessions. So he kind of has this catalog for how all of these ridiculous things are done, even though Flambeau, his modus operandi is basically to get as close to breaking the laws of physics as is <laughs> feasibly possible before actually breaking them. Yeah, I, I really enjoy the way that, that Father Brown is positioned there that because he is close enough to the crimes that he understands them, but not close enough to be accused of doing them, he's able to kind of build his own catalog, his own little library of crimes and all the different ways in which he would do a crime. He actually shows up Flambeau by saying, you know, I suspected that you would do the whirly hurdy gurg And Flambeau's like, what the heck is that? And he's and then Father Brown says, oh, you haven't heard of the, the whirly hurdy gurg that's, <laughs> oh, that's an advanced technique, my friend. I know. Like, it's well, great. I mean, the, enti- the entire story, the first, talk the, first one, the collection, is mm. Father Brown committing a bunch of crimes to yes. get the cops on their trail, <laughs> which is just, mm. it's like, oh, yeah. And then I threw soup at the wall and I swapped the salt and the sugar. It's like, it's all inane stuff. My favorite one is when he makes Flambeau pay too much at the at the restaurant that, that he takes him to because he's leading Flambeau around as they're having their little discussion. Yes. And he makes Flambeau pay too much. And the restaurant says, you know, why, why did you pay so much for this food? And Father Brown says, oh, for the window I'm about to break. And then he smashes a window with his, <laughs> with his cane or whatever. It's great. He has like a really good sense of humor on top of just being like a, a very clever clergyman, which I really mm-hmm. like. Yeah. I I, th- I think the other thing that is, is really strange is that I can't tell in my mind whether Chesterton has written the rest of the cast really well around Father Brown or whether he has just made Father Brown so adaptable to any set of cast that it kind of works. Because we go from like being chased by the world's greatest detective to being in a home full of incredibly wealthy people to being at a restaurant with like military people. Like there's all, there's all this sort of upper class ish energy to it. And he's able to show them up, right? Like, but yeah, he's always able to show them up. That's, that's the fun part again of Flambeau and why we grow to kind of like Flambeau is because even though he's a criminal and he threatens to, to like murder father Brown at one point, Mm-hmm. he's showing up the foppish nobles, right? Oh, like, yeah. I mean, he he even says uh, at the start of The Flying Stars, he's like, my last crime was incredibly Dickensian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he says, he, he's like, I have a specific plan for each holiday of the year and each individual person that I that I steal from, I steal from them in a very particular way. Like, he, he wants to show people that he's, like not as he's not a terrible human being as as they say, and the 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 restaurant crime, which is a it's a steely crime. It's a let's steal all the silverware crime, which is an underappreciated crime in this day and age. Usually, it's a <laughs> it's a bank vault or a wallet or or whatever or the the secret codes. But stealing silverware is is a good one, and he accomplishes it simply by wearing a coat that could be considered to be either that of the servants who run around with their like black suits on. Or if you look at it from a different angle, it could make you look like one of the military guests there who also are wearing these like black suits. And it's not a complicated answer. It's just he changes posture slightly to, to look like one or the other, you know, character that he's trying to portray. Yeah, I mean there's this moment in the first story where they walk past Father Brown at the beginning and they're like, ah, oh, there's a little short old priest, but it's just after they've pointed out that Flambeau is this huge hulking man. And my assumption was that it was just going to be Flambeau like crouching under priest's robes. And it still is a clue that uh, Flambeau is in priest's robes when they get later on in the story, but I like that it comes back around and pays off that potential hook by having him do it later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. They establish very quickly that his reputation is specifically that he can look and act like anyone. 
and that ties into all of his all the different stories that he's a part of. It ties into the Flying Stars. It ties into the Queer Feet. You know, it ties into all the stories that he can pretend to be anybody that he chooses. But what's special about Chesterton's portrayal, I think, is that in the first story, it's very visual. Whereas in the feet story, the feet story. in the feet story, the way that we talk about it is through audio cues. Father Brown is sitting in a a private space in a in a, a vestibule or whatever. I think that's the right word. Anyway, he's, he's he's sitting there. He can't see what's going on, but he can hear what he perceives is the same set of feet in the same shoes walking in many different ways. And of course, he realizes, oh. It's someone like pretending to be lots of different people and walking completely differently each time. My, what, what a dance that must be, you know, that sort of thing. So again, yeah. we're tying into the like art aspect of, of the dance of the back and forth and we're using senses other than the visual, which is always fun. I think the other thing that's really fantastic too is the volley of one-liners. Like I already mentioned the one about the French being thinking machines. There's another great line in the same paragraph saying that the French electrify the world not by starting any paradox, they electrify it by carrying out a truism, which I don't I don't even know what to think of that line, but God did I enjoy reading it. I, look, it was another time and place when we could just insult the French and get away with it um, <laughs> in, in our esteemed papers. There's there's another bit where they're talking about like socialism and yes. they're like yeah, he the wants he guy. wants every chimney sweep paid but won't allow you to own your own soot and someone's like why would you want to own, own their soot? own soot yeah it's great I mean that whole sequence like not to get overly political but like that that is a wild premise where they're like ah the socialists the the ultimate suspect for our crime like mm -hmm. that was a very it's a very kind of bizarre way to set up a a criminal suspect to be like yeah he wants like equal pay he doesn't <laughs> Sorry. really know how to get it uh he's our criminal suspect for today just, i was what? just what looking found? through looking at this scene again and came across the line and a conservative does not mean a man who preserves jam <laughs> yep 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 <laughs> father brown he he puts the haters out to pasture um, it's great. What a, what a, what a sentence. Yeah. What a sentence. It does, it does backfire a little bit, especially when we start talking about like Jewish people. Yes. In oh, the flying no. stars <laughs> as, as like golden age crime fiction is unfortunately frequent in doing, but you know what? I, I, I can, I can. I can grit my teeth and bear a few real painfully aged lines in return for some of these absolute zingers. That and the and the queer feet also is a little bit anti-Semitic, let's say. It's look, sometimes authors make mistakes, and that's just something we're gonna have to agree with. Here's the master of paradox, after all. Now I suppose Herds before we wrap up this section, you had asked me to read up to a line in The Invisible Man wherein Father Brown shows up on the scene and is about to unveil the solution, mm -hmm. I presume, for I whatever so. is happening. Who, what is this invisible man? How did someone carry letters into a building unnoticed? How would that even happen? How could such a thing be possible? How would you kill someone in their own home or maybe someone else's home. I forget. It doesn't really matter when there are policemen on every corner and no one is seen going into the building. Like how could someone kill someone without being seen? It must be the socialists. It must be the invisible socialists. Mm -hmm. That the is visible socialists with jam. They've packed their shoes with jam rendering themselves and if, invisible. if I know one type of invisible socialist, Ben, uh -oh. it's the heavily unionized industry of posties. Oh, okay. That's an interesting <laughs> and specific industry to choose. Because I was picturing Flambeau was talking <laughs> in, his previous, in yep. his previous little story, The Flying Stars, about his greatest crime. And that's not really a murder mystery. It's, it seems like a, a reprieve from everything else that's going on mm. in the collection. Mm. And just while I was thinking about Christmas, while I was thinking about Dickens, I was thinking about large bags that could carry things like letters or bodies. Okay, fair enough. Unnoticed, perhaps. So I reckon that Santa Claus came in, mm -hmm. committed the crime. He put his red coat in 
with his white load of washing, and that's why there's a red smear on the on the floor. Mm-hmm. It's not blood. Okay. And then he put the body into his big old sack of presents, mm-hmm. and then summoned his reindeer, saluted the Coca Cola sign for giving him the outfit that you're probably all picturing him with. You know you're gonna have and to solve another mystery. You don't have Japan to give. To you don't have, have KFC. To, you don't have to give multiple theories because this is clearly your fake theory that doesn't make any sense. I don't see how someone <laughs> with a big bag with a body in it could possibly make it past four trained policemen who are not corrupt <laughs> or French. I hope. Okay. Here's the thing I, I can't get though, and I want to confess this okay, before please. we close this section. Please tell me. Who in this story is the is the posty? That's a great question. We haven't had that introduced, but that's what it has to be, right? So I'm gonna say Santa Claus because I think that's just okay. as plausible as anyone. I guess knows. I'm gonna I guess I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to dot points if you're incorrect there, but we'll we'll get we'll get to it. We'll get to it. It's gonna be great. Anyway, you're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. We are talking The Innocence of Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton, the first five stories in that collection. And we'll be back with more in just a second. Stick around. You're on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here in our first week discussing The Innocence of Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton. Before we get back into the swing of things, I did want to say it is Sydney Writers' Festival weekend, and in case you missed it, just a couple of days ago up on the Final Draft Great Conversations podcast, my conversation with Pip Williams about her latest novel, The Bookbinder of Jericho, went up Pips had a couple of talks at the Sydney Writers' Festival this weekend, and it was a good time getting to dive in and explore a few more perspectives of that. But if you wanted to catch up on it, it is over, as I said, on the Great Conversations podcast, and I will have links up on our page to get over to that. Back to G.K. Chesterton, though, we are discussing up to and including The Invisible Man and uh, Herds, my little theory. Yeah. I stand by what I said. It was Santa Claus. Do you? I don't know why you would say that. The they literally tell you who the murderer is. I don't. It's it's Welkin. I don't understand. They say very early on in the story there are, there are two people trying to court this woman. Three technically. There's Isidore, <laughs> Welkin, and Angus. And Isidore is the man who is killed. Angus is the new kid on the block. Yep. And Welkin goes for long walks. Welkin goes I'm, for long walks. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. And I'll show you miss that one, Flex. Yeah, um, I I must confess, I think I was looking for like I was thinking a little too straightforwardly. I must confess the story the story had a one up on me here. Straightforwardly? I guess so. I think you must have been reading very quickly, would be my guess. But it's it's fine. I uh, Yeah, I'm sure I definitely <laughs> Uh, read the right chapters for today's episode. You definitely did. And we definitely didn't have a chat about that just before going live. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyway, flying stars. What's the solution to flying stars, Flex? (laughs) Anyway... Yeah, no, I mean, look. Oh my the, God, there wasn't really anything to solve in this story. Why'd you ask me to read up to when Brown shows is, up? There isn't even a, a murder in this story. Crazy. No, <laughs> um, look, to be clear, I, I don't really care that much about you missing Welkin because the question isn't actually uh, who who killed the man. It's what profession was the man what killed him? Yes. As we mentioned for the interview, we have a man who is able to walk past all his policemen. It is an interesting interpretation of a locked room mystery. Uh, by that, I mean that there is no actual lock. There are just lots of witnesses who say they saw nobody. But of course, when they say they saw nobody, they're saying that they saw nobody of note. They saw the equivalent of a of a servant, right? Well, it's like it's like the 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 train car method, right? Where the train car has a guard at one end who is in theory always there. So who could possibly have gotten past them? You know, we've seen that in a number of stories. Yeah, it's now. it's a pretty classic little trope, and it's it's one that Chesterton likes to employ. And yeah, I mean, this story is is kind of neat. We we bring flambeau back on the case and it's a story about love which is certainly a topic that chesterton is is interested in but it is more about the denial the denial of love than the embracing of love which is a curious one yeah i guess 
while we're talking about curious parts of solutions, I was very perplexed by the whole setup and payoff of the second story in the collection, The Secret Garden. Oh, yeah? There's this scene in The Secret Garden where the crime actually happens. There's like a big old flash and everyone sees a character out in the garden. They see Commandant O'Brien out there. They think... They say, like, a tall figure in blue was striding across the lawn towards the study door. A glint of moonlit silver on facings picked him out as Commandant O'Brien, and it ends up not being him. But that entire sequence of the unveiling of the crime was just bizarre. Yeah, I mean, that story is more about the gotcha of the detective being the killer, I think. Even though that detective disappears at a certain point they, they just find him dead like when he realizes he's been made by father brown well they they go in to ask him to confess and yes he has... and he's already dead it's a good little scene for what it is it's like it's quite dramatic he, he, yeah it, it, dramatic is the right word he's like in his chair st- stoically seated and they realize he's not responding the blind to face was more than the pride of cato it says that's that's the one the pride of cato a classic um, but the, the fun part of the actual how of the murder of, of the second story is that they've, they've had a body switch, right? And the head of the body that's found in the locked room equivalent, the secret garden, the head has come from outside and the head of the body that was killed there is somewhere else in the river. I think really what they should have done is had a scene where they compared the head to the body and said, ha ha, he's quite beside himself. <laughs> that would have been very funny. That would have really made the story. Would have really I tickled think. my giblets. <laughs> but I did really like the sequence of them explaining how Valentine got the second head to make the crime work. Like he'd prepared this so far in advance that he had robbed his own department's guillotine box. Mm-hmm. And nobody noticed. Apparently. Yeah, it's a bit, it's it's very silly. Yeah, I mean, there's even this line where Father Brown's like, oh yeah, there's some uh, criminological nonsense that he came up with to explain <laughs> it away to his inferiors. It, it is curious. I am, I'm thinking now about that thing about, about the love of the characters. There, there is love in this story as well. Although again, do they get together at the end as the... The, the like noble couple I don't know that they do no no it, it sort of it's it's cuts it's off a red that pun intended yeah it's well that's what's curious I guess it's kind of the red herring because you're supposed to suspect that the, the bloke who loves the girl would kill the guy but why would he not kill her father because that's the guy he's having the, the tiff with that sort of thing but it is curious that these are both stories that involve like romance and love but don't really reconcile that element of the plot in any in any way well yeah there's like there's a lot of big personalities in here that have very like strong characterization but it's kind of unless you are the detective the criminal or the story's chosen half watson (laughs) there's not really you don't really matter pull for your characterization to be a foundation there's there's not an arc for those characters because we've got all these self-contained short stories and it's not about like showing off this little corner of the world and these characters that like live in the world and are real it's about setting up a specific circumstance for a murder that father brown can show off their skill with and for flambeau to to play around in usually something to keep an eye on i guess going forward to see if there are any side characters that get proper character arcs kind of curious to see how that goes I think the other thing that I did want to address before we like wrapped up today's episode is that the Queer Feet and the Flying Stars, they are enjoyable in the sense that Flumbo is a fun character. But? But as evidenced by how little else we've said directly about them, they are kind of significantly worse than the other ones we've read. Well, first off, they're not murder mysteries. Not properly anyway. N- that would be but, fine. But, but, hold on, I'm not done here. Yeah. But also the solutions that we have are simple in a way that is like, I don't know, it's it's not that exciting to see Father Brown figure it out. Like, yeah. I, I know, like when Father Brown's sitting there listening to the footsteps, he goes, oh, they're, mo- they're moving back and forth. Oh, there's so many footsteps. Like it feels a bit, a bit silly. Yeah. 
And in The Flying Stars, we have Uncle putting on his clown makeup so that he can go and make, I don't know. Like, it feels very estranged, I think, from our usual, more interesting affairs of, like, someone has been killed in the garden or the scandal. You know? Yeah, like the, the the quality of the writing in terms of like those one liners and the little bit about the Dickensian thing at the start of the Flying Stars are like great little bits, but the story as a whole doesn't like come together in the same way. And like a large part of that, I think, is definitely the historical cringe of seeing <laughs> Chesterton's views on Jewish people. Yep. I think also part of that coming together is also to do with the finales for the criminals because Flambeau. Like when he's been caught, he just kind of gives up the stones that he's stolen, which doesn't compare to Valentine's ending. Like yeah. that is easily the best ending uh, so far that we've had in the novel. Yeah, like the theatrics are really strong in the better stories that we've read so far. The other thing, of course, is, and Welkin, case in point, I've made a bit of a to-do about the fact that you didn't figure out who it was, but like- You seemed so upset. But the, the book doesn't care either. Yes. The last page of the book is, we found the postman and then Father Brown went and had a chat with a murderer. And it's like, oh, look at him talking to criminals, which is a thing that he does. And that's cool and very clergyman of him, but it's not an exciting ending. It's not dramatic. It's just, it, we don't really- have a proper resolution to Welkin, who we have never spoken to before, never seen before, part of the premise of the story, but also, like, he he's not a character. He's a postman. That's all he is and all he will ever be, which is why he turned to a life of he, crime. He took long walks and he is one of the three suspects. Apparently. That's what we're led to believe. Like, honestly, when I was reading it in my first read-through, I was like, is it going to turn out that Angus is secretly Welkin? Because why else would we just not- have Welkin show up. Like, I yeah. don't... <laughs> like, it's very my, strange. My first reading, honestly, was that, like, Welkin uh, was one of the... Like, like he was... Oh, gosh. There was another character named Welkin that we read a short while ago. Was there? And I'm trying to remember what book it was in, but he was, like, house staff, and I was conflating the two. Oh, my goodness. The Crooked Hinge. You're thinking yes. of the Crooked Hinge. That is bizarre. Squirrely, uh, not not house staff. The squirrely like lawyer guy. That's right. Yeah, like I was I was thinking of him as an offsider, kind of implicitly because of that relationship with the crooked hinge. That's very interesting. Which curiously, I remember Brad mentioned to us that Chesterton was one of the inspirations for the crooked hinge, and I want mm. I, it can't be this story, right? I hope not. This would be a pretty sad character to be like borrowing from. It also it it also <laughs> like, has like nothing to do with the crooked hinge. <laughs> That we know of. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, look, maybe the Invisible Man is just I'm, smarter than us. I'm just saying, there's some maybe invisible crime going on in the Crooked Hinge. I'm mm -hmm. just saying. That's my it's recollection. True. When some they say the Crooked Hinge, really what they mean is that the hinge is invisible and the door is levitating. <laughs> the door is so far above our heads that we, we don't notice it's there. Mm -hmm. That's the Until real it secret. It falls heavily and crushes us beneath it, and that's how the crime uh, is done. That is that is an excellent, excellent door. <laughs> I love that. All righty. Well, Herds, I suppose that has us pretty well covered for this week's edition of The Innocence of Father Brown. What am I up to for next week? Well, speaking of acts of God and the supernatural, we will be reading up to The Hammer of God. Ooh. I'm going to have you solve that, that story, which... Alex Pavese famously recommended when we had him on for an interview. It's true. That is what Alex Pavese is known for. That's what he's known for. This is the <laughs> one thing other than all the books. Anyway, look, it doesn't matter. Point is, we're reading The Hammer of God, and I'm going to have you read up to, because this is a perfect line. This is Father Brown speaking. He says, I will give you two very large hints. I want you to read up to that line. That's, what is <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's great. I love that so much. <laughs> I want you to read up to the point where he's going to give you the hints and then solve it for me. I'm Perfect. sure you will have no trouble at all, but Sounds I think it'll be fun. <laughs> excellent. You are listening uh, to Death of the Reader here on 2SER 107.3. We are talking The Innocence of Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton. We'll be back next week with more on your murder mystery world tour. Stay tuned. You're on 2SER 107.3.